The Bible reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15, and Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 8. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray for your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they will be heard because because many be heard because of their many words do not be like them for your father knows what you need you need before you ask him this then is how you should pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock on the door and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Amen. Thank you so much, Kevin. Let's pray together. Dear Father, it's this simple prayer that we now offer to you as we come to hear your word. Speak, Lord, for we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When I was at uh, primary school, every day started by saying, the Lord's Prayer together as the class. We had to stand up to do so. Back then, I didn't understand what I was saying because I didn't know at that stage who I was praying to. I didn't have a relationship with God. I didn't know I wasn't a follower of Jesus. And I didn't know why I needed to pray at that stage as well. As a young boy, you think the life's ahead of you. You're gallus, as they said in Glasgow. I could do anything. The world is your oyster. You didn't really think about God in that sense. And so praying the Lord's Prayer was an empty ritual. Now I'm a Christian. I love the Lord's Prayer. I love it. My grandpa, who is a keen artist in calligraphy pen, drew this when he was at school. That was a long time ago. He's now with the Lord in glory. And I have this up on my wall in the room in the house where I generally have my quiet time where I pray and read my Bible. And it reminds me of a man of prayer, my grandfather, and of this brilliant pattern which Jesus has given us of how we can speak to God. A pattern, not a, a ritual, where we just say it without thinking, but a pattern for our prayers. So today, as we start a new series, Living the Jesus Way, for the next few weeks, we're going to be finding out what it means to be a Christian and how to grow as followers of Jesus. And absolutely critical, absolutely critical as a, to follow Jesus is to have a prayer life with God. To be able to talk to God, to be able to talk to Jesus in prayer. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, probably the greatest preacher of the 20th century, said this, prayer is the highest activity of the human soul. It's the Christian's vital breath. And just like breathing, we need to breathe to live, to take in oxygen, to survive. Prayer keeps us alive spiritually. <coughs> It's that important. Yet if we're honest, prayer is hard work, isn't it? I've been a Christian now for 41 years and prayer never gets any easier. It's a spiritual battle every day 
to have my quiet time to pray, a devotional time alone with God, for him to speak to me through his living word, and he still speaks today through this to us, and for me to, to speak to him, to talk to him. The many responsibilities which you will know you have as well, and distractions too, not just in the life that we lead, but from the world around us. Push prayer to the margins of our life, don't they? Just when I'm getting started my morning prayers, my stomach starts to rumble and my mind get dis gets distracted. And then 30 seconds later, I'm downstairs making a cup of coffee or my cereal, you know. And there are times when I'm just lazy. I don't want to get out of bed to talk to God. I just have to admit that. Maybe you're the same. And perhaps you're struggling like me today to pray. Not knowing what to pray about. Discouraged maybe that there are no answers. Is there a ceiling? Is there a blockage between me and God? Maybe bored, if I can say that, with the routine of your prayer life. Or just wondering, what's the point? If, as we've prayed, your will be done. If God's will is going to be done anyway, what's the point of praying? Maybe you'd love to know how to pray. David, how do you go about it? Well, let's start to explore that journey just now together. We're in good company if you want to know how to pray. I want to know how to pray. I want to know how to grow in prayer. And we're in good company because Jesus' disciples saw Jesus praying every day, going often to a quiet place on his own. And Jesus, they saw him praying when he was tempted, needing strength to do God's will, and when making important decisions. We've all got important decisions, haven't we? We all need to come before God and ask for his help at those crucial moments in our life, like the young people that Nathan was praying for, exams and so on. And these disciples, they said, they didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. Teach us how to heal people. What did they say? Teach us to pray. Wonderful. Astonishing. That's what they said. Luke 11, verse 11. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray, Lord. They were desperate to be able to pray. And they saw Jesus. He was a man of prayer. And if Jesus needs to pray, we need to pray. If he needs to pray, we need to pray. It's that simple and it's that profound. Jesus answered his disciples' request by teaching them this most famous of prayers in the world, the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps it's better to call it the disciples' prayer because I don't think the Lord would have prayed this prayer word for word. Why? Because Jesus, the perfect man, never needed to ask forgiveness for his sins. So here's the pattern. In our passage today, Jesus teaches us four key attitudes for an effective prayer life. And the first is to pray sincerely, to pray sincerely. Jesus expected his disciples to pray. So he says four times, when you pray, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. And he assumes that we'll pray every day. This is why he says, pray for your needs. Give us today our daily bread. So that's something we need to do every day. In dependency upon him. And Jesus says we should pray with sincerity. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now Jesus isn't against public prayer. Or standing to pray. No, he's calling out an insincere attitude when we come before God. And the religious leaders of this time were called the Pharisees. And they liked to stand in public places to be seen by others. It was all style and no substance. <laughs> so how do we pray sincerely? Well, do we want to meet with Jesus, to talk to our maker and our friend? To praise him for, for his glory and greatness? To thank him for his love and faithfulness to us each day? The Lord sees our heart motive. It's less about what we say in our words. Sometimes we not be, might not be able to say anything. But the Lord sees our hearts. Are we sincere? Do, do we struggle with prayer? Well, that's not such a bad thing. 
But maybe as we come in our struggles, as long as we're sincere, that's the great starting point. And then Jesus says, not only should we pray sincerely, we should pray privately. In contrast to the show-off prayers of the Pharisees, our private prayers are to be a secret act, a secret act of devotion between us and our Heavenly Father. Verse 6 again. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So, do we have a quiet place where we can meet with Jesus? Liz and I have different rooms in the house for our personal secret times with God. Those of you with families will need to be creative, I think, especially when you see a sign on your teenager's door like this. A friend of mine, when his kids were small, couldn't get a minute's peace with God. So what did he do? He shot himself in the loo for five or ten minutes. That was the only quiet time he could get. Susanna Wesley it was the mother of the famous preacher John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, and the great hymn writer Charles Wesley. Her quiet time challenge was her ten children. Wow. So every day Susanna got up, got her Bible, went to her favourite chair, and threw her long apron up over her head. It became her tabernacle tent, her private meeting place with God. And everyone in the house knew this was important to her and left her alone. So whether it's in the home, maybe out on a walk, maybe you connect with God better out in creation, I don't know. <coughs> or in the office before work. Wherever it is, wherever your quiet time, time alone, even if it's short, take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord, as the hymn says. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. If we don't aim to pray, then we'll not pray. Plan a time and a place each day, a place and time that suits you. Start small, five or ten minutes, and then grow from there. Pray even when you don't feel like it. I sometimes have to start, and it's only after a few minutes that you really start to, to get into it. You really start to pray, and it becomes real instead of going through the motions. Jesus says, pray in secret, and then the Lord will reward you in secret. God's presence will come. He will come by the Spirit and meet with you personally. That intimate time with you and God, a real experience just like the high priest back in the Old Testament when he experienced the Shekinah glory of God in that holiest of all. You can experience that as a follower of Jesus. Then, not just praying sincerely or privately, but praying simply, praying simply. Here's verse 7 and 8 again. When you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your heavenly Father knows what you need, even before you ask him. Wonderful. In Jesus' day, the pagans, they prayed to multiple gods rather than the one true God. They hoped by praying their mantra more fervently, more frequently, that the gods would just have to answer. The Lord doesn't need to be persuaded or browbeaten into answering. Mindless words, they don't impress him. He loves when we talk to him just simply, as a friend to a friend, or as a child to a father, as we'll see. Now, this is very, very important. If there's one thing you take out of this passage today, it's this, that prayer is relational. It's not a ritual. Prayer is relational, not a ritual. And this is why the Lord Prayer opens with our Father who is in heaven. That word father is Abba in Aramaic, Abba. And Abba means daddy. You see that in the lovely picture on the screen. It's the affectionate name Jewish infant children and even grown-up children use for their father. And Jesus says praying is like that. It's just like a little child asking for their daddy for help. Asking for their daddy and speaking well of their dad. It's that simple. 
Last week, my son asked me for support with something that he was really struggling with. And it was a simple request. So we connected, we met up, and I listened and reassured him and said I would give him help if he needed it. And it's the same with our loving Heavenly Father. Sometimes, you know, we're afraid to share with others for fear of rejection, for fear of getting pushed away. If we share our heart, they might not understand and that might result in a broken friendship or relationship. But God is never like that. Just look at the Psalms. They cry to God in terrible times, like the psalm we've heard this morning, Psalm 31, that you Ukrainians are play, praying every day. We can bring anything to God. Our struggles, our fears, our anxiety, our anger, our frustration, our joys, and our thankfulness. The Father never turns us away. He loves to help. We just need to ask him. Tell him your worries. Please tell him your worries. Speak to him. Speak to him about your joys. Speak to him about your sorrows. Speak to him about, about those broken dreams that you've had. Speak to him about your needs. Tell him how you're feeling, whether rubbish or right on. I realize some of you will hard, find it hard to approach God as a father because your own father was unloving, maybe cruel, maybe never there. And I'm so sorry about that. You might be angry and sad, but the fact that you are sad about that means that you know what a good father is like. And the heavenly father is the father you've always wanted. He's the father you've always wanted. He'll be there for you. He knows all about you, even before you ask. Maybe you've never known God in this real and personal way today. Perhaps your prayers and friendships with Jesus have become formal and empty, as if it's hitting a barrier. They're not getting through. If you'd love to know God today and your prayers to be real, then this is how you can have that experience. Put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Put your trust and faith in him. The Bible says that he is the, the mediator. He's the go-between between us and God. If, if we've got to come to know the Father, we have to come through Jesus. The Bible says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. The only time that Jesus didn't say my Father in his prayer life was when he was hanging on a central cross outside a hill, on a hill outside Jerusalem. And as they put the nails in his hands and his feet, and as he hung there in three hours of darkness, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time... He didn't pray, my father. And he was forsaken for you so that you could be, you could have the father in heaven as your own personal father. Is that real? Would you love to do that today? Would you love to know the father like that? Jesus was forsaken by God so that we could be forgiven by the father. Confess your sin to him. Tell him how you've messed up. Be real with him. And when we do, we will be forgiven. If we confess our sin, the Bible says, he is faithful and just and he will forgive our sin and to cleanse us, to heal us, to separate all that that's wrong between him, us and God, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness and he'll bring you into his family. You'll be adopted into God's family forever and you will receive, you will receive a special gift. We all like gifts, don't we? When we trust in the Lord Jesus in that way, we receive the gift of God, the Holy Spirit. And he comes and lives within us. And we become the temple of the Holy Spirit, our bodies, our lives. And when we're walking around, we have the Holy Spirit of God with us. And so he helps us, the Holy Spirit. So when we're, we're struggling to pray, the Bible says that, that the Holy Spirit comes and meets with us. And with groanings that can be uttered, he, he presents our prayers to God. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. I struggle to pray. Maybe you do too. But I'm so thankful for God, the Holy Spirit, who's right here with me and who helps me in my stumbling words and gives me, gives God the words that I want to say to him. So pray sincerely, pray privately and pray simply to the Father. Finally, pray humbly, pray humbly. The Lord's Prayer is just six short phrases and they're a brilliant pattern for our own prayer life. 
The first three phrases are directed to God and his glory. And the second are all about our needs and the needs of those around us. Although God is our heavenly father, at the same time, we must approach him humbly with reverence and awe. God isn't our mate. He may be a friend, but he's not our mate in that sense. He's the king of kings who reigns in majesty. That's why we say, hallowed be your name, O Lord. It means to give adoration. It means to worship the Lord God Almighty who made all things and who fulfills all things. Sadly, God's name is flippantly abused in our culture. I think we have to admit that. His name is not respected. And so when we're praying this prayer, hallowed be your name, we're saying, Lord, may your name be highly regarded in my life, in the life of my family, in this community, and in this world. And when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're also asking that we'll humbly live out our calling as God's holy people. That's why God called us and forgave us and adopted us into his family so that we would become his holy people and we would shine for others so that others can see Jesus too. And when we see the way our friend, who we've prayed for already, Carol, patiently enduring her discomfort and illness, she is bringing glory to God through her suffering. I can see it when I visited her just last week. She's bringing glory to God through her suffering in her, her own personal experiences. So let's pray to God to be glorified in our lives and in others' lives, in our challenges, our relationships, our conversations with each other, our work, our studies, and our parenting. And what this, the Lord's Prayer teaches us is that we can pray about God's purposes in our life. We want God's purposes to be fulfilled. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, O Lord, as it is in heaven. Jesus often preached the good news of his kingdom so that everyone and everything would acknowledge him as saviour and king. And this isn't just a, a longing for Christ's return and reign in the future. It's asking for God's kingdom rule to come in hearts and lives, all hearts and lives, right here, right now. Praying for God's purposes. We can help bring in kings, uh, God's kingdom by praying for our family, friends, and contacts to come to know Jesus as king. And by praying for God's blessing in the lives of those in our church here and in the missions across the world. If you haven't got one, make a weekly and daily prayer list. Write down two or three friends, family, contacts that you have or missions or activities that are going on in the church and just list them. A few on Monday, a few on Tuesday and so on and pray for them faithfully every day. When we pray, your will be done, we acknowledge God's right to rule in our lives. We're saying, God, you know best. Your way is best. So although we can ask our Heavenly Father for anything, as we grow in faith, that Ferrari and Dior dress, well, they just slip down the prayer list. God's provision, not just purposes. Give us today our daily bread. It's praying for God's provision for us and our needs. Do you know, we take things for granted in this country, don't we? We go to the shops, we can just buy off the shelf, we just take the clothes that we want to wear off the peg, yet we're finite. We go hungry, don't we? The clothes wear out. And yet we think our credit card that we are God, we can just tap and we can get it when we want it. But what happens up the food chain? Who are the ones providing? As we go back through the food chain, ultimately, it goes back to God, who gives us the grain, who sends the rain, who gives the sun that makes it grow. Everything that we have is given by him. He provides. Do we say grace at mealtimes? Just simply, thank you, God, for the food. Before shopping, do we ask for God to provide what we need, not what we want? Does our credit card again make us think, we don't need you, God? Are we grateful to God for our income, whether it's through an employer, through the benefit system, or through a pension? 
It all comes from God. The 19th century Christian George Muller cared for over 10,000 children in his orphanages. Without funding, he trusted God to provide every day by offering the daily prayer for bread. Give us today our daily bread. And on one occasion, he sat at breakfast and there was 300 hungry orphan children there and there was nothing for them to eat. So he just put a prayer up to God and suddenly there was a banging at the door. The local baker brought in three huge trays of bread. I'd been up since two in the morning, he said, baking for you. And then there was another knock at the door. The milkman appeared next. His cart had broken down outside and wondered if they could use a load of fresh milk. God provides. God does provide, sometimes in miraculous ways. And then God pardons. Jesus knows our spiritual needs. He knows my needs. I mess up. We all mess up, don't we? Even the godliest Christians. Unconfessed sin, it acts as a barrier between us and God. It's difficult to talk to somebody when you're not in speaking terms, isn't it? And so unconfessed sin stops us talking to our Father in heaven. So let's pray honestly. Forgive us our debts, Father, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And we will receive this wonderful, gracious pardon from God who freely forgives. We might also need to say sorry to someone. Write a letter. Return something that doesn't belong to us. Are we in debt to someone? Or love somebody, even when they don't love us in return, even when they've treated us badly. The prayer I use frequently to receive God's pardon is the Jesus prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I often have to pray that prayer. Then finally, God's protection. We see his protection in verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, O Lord. Deliver us, Lord. Deliver us. Now, clearly, God doesn't tempt us. So we're not asking for God to stop doing that. It's the evil one, God's enemy, who tempts us. But temptation here can also mean testing or trials. We need God's help to overcome temptation. We need the strength to persevere in the daily walk of life, in the daily trials that we face. It might be opposition to our faith. It might be disappointment, rejection, illness, depression, loss of income, bereavement. Whatever it is, we can come and ask for God's strength, God's protection. Because in these times, the devil can trap us and trip us up. While this is a private prayer, we also need the support in prayer of the church family. We all need each other for these challenges. And so that's why the prayer starts, Our Father. I think the disciples prayed it together with Jesus. And I think it was great when we prayed it together today at the outset of our service. It's a community prayer too. And it was truly a blessing last Wednesday night to pray for our church, the community, and indeed the world's needs. So in our trials and in our temptations, Jesus says to us, do not fear because I have overcome the world. Call on me and I will answer. How do we grow in our friendship with Jesus? By praying sincerely. By praying privately. By praying simply. And by praying humbly. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything. Absolutely everything to him in prayer. Let's do that now. Our loving and holy Heavenly Father, will you teach us to pray? Will you give us a passion for prayer? Help us to make time to talk to you each day. May it deepen our friendship with Jesus and help us to live to honour you, Lord. Lord, would you come and set up your kingdom, your kingdom reign in us and in others, so that everyone on earth, 
obeys you as you're obeyed in heaven. Lord, give us today what we need, not what we want. We depend upon you for our life, our breath, our growth. Lord, we need you. Lord, forgive us for doing wrong. And we take this moment to forgive those who have wronged us. Set us free from that burden. Thank you for the cross that covers all our sins and Jesus' resurrection that give us, gives us new life. Lord, keep us from being tempted. Strengthen us when we're tested and protect us from the trials and tribulations and evil in this world. For with you is all glory, blessing and power forevermore. Amen.